Welcome to everyone out there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Robert Greif. I'm currently the director of the ESC for ILCO and guidelines. And it's really a pleasure to moderate this webinar. It's an exciting webinar on pediatric registers. We have five speakers, so a tense program and five moderators, which will bring you and guide you through the webinar. Only a few words how the webinar works. Please use the Q&A function for your questions. The chat is for you, for welcome other people. We will not attend the chat. Please type in your question in the Q&A function and we try to answer whatever is possible. Uh, we will record this webinar, so there's the chance to uh, see, look it up later or disseminate it to other people. Uh, and with further ado, I will uh, guide, uh, I will hand over to Kasper, who will make an introduction and we now will tell us why this webinar, why the topic is so important. Please, Kasper. Yeah, thank you very much, Tino. Uh, so my name is Kasper Lorksen and uh, I'm an ED physician in Denmark and uh, representative of the Young ERC and we're very pleased to welcome you all to this uh, webinar on pediatric cardiac arrest registries and really why have we chosen this topic? Well, first of all, uh, I think we need to consider two things. The first thing is that the pediatric cardiac arrests are really these high stake events where we have the opportunity to save many patient years for each event. And the second factor is that because they are so rare, we have very limited evidence as compared to the adult cardiac arrests. And we, for many years, we have just extrapolated our knowledge from the adult setting. So in a moment, I will hand over the word to Vinay. Uh, Vinay Natkani is an attending physician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and endowed chair at the, um, <clears throat> and he's also a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine, and he's a key member, both in ILCOR and the HA, and he's been working on the guideline recommendations for many years. And Vinay will put a bit more detail about where are our knowledge gaps, how do we overcome the knowledge gaps, and also how do the uh, registries play a key role in this. So. Please, Vinay. Well, thank you, Casper, Tino, and uh, it's a great pleasure. Hello to everybody. I think we all know that the formula for survival has really been a combination of medical science, educational efficiency, and local implementation. And we know that there's a chain of survival, and we would like to measure each piece, but we have already separated, if you will, in and out of hospital cardiac arrest because the processes are so different and the players are so different in those areas. And we have in most registries, adult and pediatric, pretty much ignored the survivor, the survival link in a chain of survival. But as we think about registries today, we should be thinking about what data, what important processes are occurring in each link in the chain of the in or out of hospital cardiac arrest or, or um, uh, survival links. ILCOR has put a particular emphasis on research and registries. And if we think about it, what we know, how they're translated into guidelines, medical standards, what we teach, learn, remember, and what we do has a very variable outcome for the same patient that might arrest in a given area. And we know that a lot of this is lost in translation, but if we add in the evaluation of evidence, the audit, the review, then we can oftentimes improve survival outcomes, but they remain quite variable. And how do we measure what is an acceptable level of variability? Today, I think we'll be talking about an alphabet soup worth of mnemonics for different registries that exist or are growing. But what I'd like to do is to think about this as if there's a universe of all cardiac arrests. We wish we could capture each one of them. Registries in or out of hospital capture a few facts, a few 
consensus defini definition facts from a large universe of the cardiac arrests that are occurring. And then quality improvement consortia are a subset of that where they gather more data and work on it. Research collaborators are a smaller subset and specific research studies become even a smaller, more intense data collection subset. So as we think through the day today, I think it's important to think about these different spheres that data collection and data analysis and data output and translation is put into. So if we think about a single center that has a certain efficacy, you get 100% of the effect. When we put that into multi-center trials for efficacy, we oftentimes lose a bit of the effect of the intervention. When we put it into multi-center application outside of the study setting, we're studying effectiveness. And then when we put it into general practice with no sort of uh, rules or regulations, we look at efficiency and the patient outcome kind of suffers and we lose the original effect oftentimes because it's lost in translation as we go down the road. But it's real world application that we seek, clinical trials, registries and quality improvement. And if we embed these together, we can start to see the improved outcomes that we desire. So I'll turn it back over to you, Casper and Tino, as we move forward to think about how we collect and use real world data and how we study what we do and what the outcomes are. Thank you. So thanks, Mina, for this nice introduction and giving us the big picture, the frame to all to the individual presentations now. And it's a pleasure for me to start with the first speaker, which is Jimena de Castillo, uh, a specialist working in Madrid in a, uh, a women's children's hospital, very engaged in clinics, but also in research. And with uh, further ado, I would call you Jimena to start with your presentation, sharing your screen and why you were doing, I was realizing when I saw the, the title of your presentation, immediately it came to my mind, was, what is Pachin or how do you call this? Thank you, Tina, for this kind presentation. Well, um, I'll start ask, answering your question. Pachin stands for in hospital cardiac arrest in pediatrics and it's a register. Of course, it's read from uh, left to right because it's uh, in Spanish. The title was not in Spanish. And um, I'd like to thank the ERC for inviting me tonight, this evening, to, to share my thoughts on why registries are important. My conflicts of interest uh, only, I have the, the conflicts of interest I have to account for are only in my, my participation as the principal investigator of Pachin and one of the Petty Rescue Collaborative members. So that's because I do believe in, in registries. When I started thinking about what to share and why, why should, uh, what, why was Patina smart and uh, registry? Well, I, I wanted to tell you that I thought it was smart because it tries to look into cardiac arrest and what, what we are real, really doing, just like Vinay just, just told us, a real practice in cardiac arrest. And, and to try to answer some questions that, which we don't know the answer to, just like what's the real incidence of pediatric in hospital cardiac arrest in Europe. But the smartest thing of uh, the registry is that it doesn't, it, it includes more than one research group and one hospital, because uh, these answers do need the collaboration of many, many sites. And uh, as many sites as you can get hold of, and even more, it, includes those sites that have different characteristics, different resources, and that deal with cardiac arrest in different ways. And I thought it was charming too, because it appeals to everyone, because it uses the, the Outstain template. Uh, and well, I guess you all, you all thought the Outstain definitions were appealing. You might ask me, why do I know this? And um, 
Well, I've learned this from experience and my back to square one experience was uh, another registry, which we performed a little more than 10 years ago under the guidance of uh, the Professor Lopez Cerce in my research group, we carried the registry in mostly Latin American, Spanish, and some Portuguese and Italian country uh, hospitals. And uh, with this registry, we, we defined some of the questions we, we wanted to look at and got some really interesting data to analyze. And what's even more charming about that experience is that it opened us the door to participate in the Pedi Rescue Collaborative, which Vinay is going to explain to you all about later on. So Jimena, now I, I understand what Pachin is uh, and that it's smart and important. So I'm asking myself, how do you get these centers and what are you really recording? What are you getting for your register? Well, we are setting the focus on in-hospital cardiac arrest in children from one month to 18 years old. That's the range of age. And they have to receive a minute of chest compressions uh, in, in order to be recruited. And this has to ha happen in the, in the hospital. And the way we look into the information is mirrors the chain of survival because we, we register a patient demographic and history what would be beforehand before the cardiac arrest. How do we, uh, how the cardiac arrest was um, well developed how we resuscitated the patient, the way we applied post ross curve, and we also look into survival and uh, following the latest link in the, from the legal guide, guidelines that VNI has made reference to survivorship as we register data for from long-term follow-up. It is, it's guts, it's Pachin's guts are in an encrypted database uh, in Spain. And the platform we use is from Solomon, which uh, reunites all the legal uh, requirements uh, for the European Union in order to gather this uh, sensible medical data. And um, well, I have to confess, every, every investigator has an individual access and they can review and and manipulate their own data. And the data is supervised by, by an investigator which supervises all the, the, the cases that are entered. And I have to confess that the charming mind, that the web might not be that charming because it, it tries to gather lots of, uh, lots of data. So, uh, Jimena, do you think you can answer the question how many what is your aim? How many people do you, uh, how many patients do you want to have into, in, in your register to answer some of these open questions? Well, uh, in, in our first registry, we, we obtained data from more than 500 cases, mostly in Latin America. And, um, but it, it, they were comparable to the ones we, we, we received from the Spanish sites. And uh, some very interesting facts were, uh, were found when comparing both, both scenarios. But the thing is, um, I don't know whether we're going to be able to answer all the questions or to shed some light on all the gaps in knowledge that we can see uh, in pediatric cardiac arrest. But uh, I try to think that it, it will help us define what the real questions we have to keep on working on are. Just like uh, when we all think of carrying out, we, we all think that uh, we might be able to carry out a, a clinical trial to answer any question. But for instance, this uh, letter to the editor I lately read from Emilio Rodriguez Ruiz that, that was looking and collaborators that was looking into how many patients you had to recruit in order to answer the question of whether the, the, the patient who had a uh, defibrillating uh, rhythm were in cardiac arrest, the pediatric patient, should be defibrillated with two joules per kilo, four years per kilo. In the best scenario, they found out that they needed at least 1,000 patients to be recruited. Registries are easier to look into and they, I think uh, Pachin might help us uh, see what kind of questions we can assess in what kind of scenarios. 
So uh, just closing and wrapping it up, my key messages uh, to share with you tonight will be that um, in order to solve these gaps in knowledge, we all know and uh, we, all, we all think we, we need to ask, we need to join in and join our efforts and, uh, and then try to define what the next step is in order to keep on looking for or researching our, 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 our answers. As I, I really like a lot the African proverb that says that it takes a, a village to raise a child, because I think that when you look into it, it does take the whole scientific community to, 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 to live, uh, to, to survive to pediatric cardiac arrest, and it needs all our joint efforts. And that's all for tonight. I'll leave you my contact data in this uh, QR so you can download it. And I'm open for questions. So thanks, thanks, Jimena. Uh, very nice presentation and opening for this webinar. There's a first question directly, and you might answer because this affects also your register from Belgium, from Dominique Pierre. Uh, there are more and more problems by the European regulation on data transfer, anonymization, ethics committee want more and more information. How do you handle all this? If somebody well, wants to participate in your register, well, we we when we set up Patin, we tried to to set it up in the way that uh, it met all the legal requirements for the European Union, and it does meet the legal requirements for for uh, countries like Argentina or Chile or other Latin American countries. Um, the the problem for. Uh, that this uh, has to be accounted is that uh, is that it, it, it's uh, it's cost wise it is it's very it's very costly it uh, but we we asked for a grant in order to support this uh, the this this database that uh, well this, the the people uh, who made the database uh, and who who host the database work on this with all, all kind of medical registry so. It's costly, but it does meet all the requirements for all eth ethic committees and legal services that we've been asked to. Okay, thanks. And because we, we, we are, I have to look at the time, I would like to hand over to Francesc for the next speaker. Hi, thank you, Tina. Um, my name is Francesc Carmona. I'm a physician in the emergency medical system in Barcelona and the brand new um, co-chair of the Science and Education Committee in Advanced Life Support. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nieves de Lucas. Um, I, know, I know Nieves from a long time ago when she has been pioneer, pioneer in, in starting pediatrics ERC courses in, in Spain, facing no few adversities as we both know Nieves. <clears throat> She's an enthusiastic of investigation of pediatrics and emergencies. She's a physician chief of uh, the service in the emergency Medi medical service of Madrid, Samur Protección Civil. And she has been one of the authors of the current gui pediatric guidelines. And she's the main investigator and the main responsible of the pet care registry. Um, Neves, the floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, I could start with the first question. What do I consider pediatric registries are so interesting again? And I would like to, to start uh, thinking about the word again. Uh, does it have some meaning in, in our context? Mm, one moment. Uh, Uh, excuse me. Yes. Well, uh, the photo is from the first months of pandemic, only focused on it. We were exhausted. That is my team. We were discouraged because we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, did you cry under your protective clothing? Uh, I did it, and also my team. At this contest, the number of cases uh, mm, 
uh, collected in our registry. We have recruited through these two research networks and our national council dropped significantly, dramatically, and the registry was no longer reliable during the pandemic. I will give my personal vision for me. Uh, the main reason is that knowledge is marvelous and funny. Uh, knowledge give, gives me joy and I love to learn. And we, uh, why do we need registries of pediatric out of hospital and emergency department cardiac arrests? What could we do with them? Well, uh, first of all, uh, to improve the outcome of our children. And of course, we have a lack of evidence supporting treatment guidelines. Secondly, we would like to set prognosis. However, pediatric cardiac arrest is rare. And let's read the definition of a rare disease. Any disease does, that affects a small percentage of the population. Therefore, we are dealing with a rare disease. And let's go with the definition of an orphan, orphan disease. It is a rare disease whose rarity means there is a lack of a market large enough to and support and resources for discovering treatments for it. That is the case of pediatric cardiac arrests. I would like to give you some data from our pediatric of the hospital and emergency department cardiac arrest during the first five years and excluding pandemic data. It is not published anymore. Uh, we found association in a bivariant analysis between good functional outcome at six and first comma scale uh, collected in the reports of the cardiac arrest. It's motor subscale, low first lactate, arterial and venous pH, low pilot, pediatric logist logistic organ dysfunction scale, and multi organ failure scale, and the low probability of death assigned by a uh, pilot scale. Also, with a um, a first rhythm of cardiac arrest, different to asystole, uh, first occlusal rhythms, hypotremia treatment, no endotracheal intubation, but endotrach endotracheal intubation was not really related to a low Glasgow coma score. And about the, out of hospital cardiac arrest, we found a association with the, present, the presence of the witness. Well, <laughs> In this slide, you can see a meeting with my youngest son, a computer engineer special, specialized in data mining after a more complex analysis. And uh, it was kind of his technical explanation. He developed a model with a PySpark library in Python, a multi-layer artificial ne neural network uh, consisting of two layers. Uh, he did the cross validation using uh, the training method method in order to take the best advantage uh, out of the data and avoiding overfitting and selection bias. And the selected evaluation metric for both the validation and test stage was uh, the area under two with a confidence interval uh, of 99%. Uh, for the data set population. Uh, for survival at six months, we find a area under curve of 0.87 plus minus 5%. And uh, for POPC one or two at six months, uh, a good functional outcome, we find an, uh, an area under curve of 0.92 plus uh, minus 4%. Um, which are our current limitations in out of hospital and emergency department registries? Well, we have a lot. <laughs> uh, pediatric cardiac arrest in out of hospital and emergency department settings are very heterogeneous. We are losing some of the hospital patients uh, who are considered dead after perhaps a short basic cardiopulmonary resuscitation without a specialized sanitary 
assistance. This kind of uh, patients frequently are not collected. Mm. The weight of uh, treatment is also different in different circumstances. For instance, adrenaline, the effect could be uh, different depending on the time from the cardiac arrest or the presence of a witness. It seems crucial in the hospital setting. If the cardiac arrest is not witnessed, it could uh, delay the cardiopulmonary resuscitation much more than if it happens at an emergency department. And about prognosis, it is not the same to predict an outcome in different moments. In the ground, uh, in order to, this, uh, to um, think if we should finish to uh, the cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the ambulance in order to decide uh, the hospital to deliver the patient and at the emergency department or at the pediatric intensive care unit. We should uh, realize uh, different, uh, we should mm, develop different analysis for its kind of predictions. Uh, however, we, we have very small databases. It implies more difficult to study different subgroups and more risk of bias in the prediction. We could uh, underfit or overfit our sample using an incomplete model or perhaps a too specific model. Um, and we need to go to the collection with several uh, diverse samples to improve its uh, effectiveness to new coming I mean, data. There are still so many, so many questions to answer. Uh, for instance, in this recent editorial, we are considering to change the intubation paradigm uh, based on several court studies in favor of, of uh, excuse me, of uh, in favor of uh, back mass ventilation and only a clinical trial in favor of intubation in cardiac arrest, but it is, it is a clinical trial. Uh, we should consider that intubation is associated also to longer resuscitation, lower GCS, impulse cardiac arrest care. Uh, it, it depends on uh, the physician experience. And do we have enough exhaustive registries considering all these factors? Well, um, we like uh, to uh, conclude uh, with some thoughts. Pediatric cardiac arrest is an orphan disease that requires special strategies. We need enough information, good and exhaustive registries, institutional support, and uh, perseverance and enthusiasm. Uh, we would like to increase the number of collected pediatric doctor hospital and emergency department cardiac arrests. And thank you. Gracias. <laughs> that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Nieves, uh, for this presentation. Um, one, one thing, I, you, you have said in your presentation that one of the problems of the registries is the small database. Um, how do you think we could uh, because we are losing patients because all the patient died and we are losing patients to, to check the, the survival. How could we make to, to uh, include more, for including more centers or more people or more um, uh, cardiac arrest centers in, in these registries? How could we engage them in, in two minutes? Because we are very... Yes. Uh, I think we... we would like to improve our marketing. <laughs> um, I think it is the, the main point because uh, we are not uh, reaching the, uh, the, the amount of centers we need. And we, knew, we need to uh, work together, uh, collaborating with different uh, mm, registries. Like uh, I am thinking in emergency department cardiac arrest, some of uh, them may be in the Jimena's registry, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, well, now it's uh, time for Francisca, I think, that, uh, that will introduce Dr. Key. Uh, so. Right, thank you. 
Um, I'm Franziska Markel, a pediatrician uh, working in Germany in Leipzig um, in a heart center. And I have the honor of introducing um, KC, an associate professor and senior consultant um, in the pediatric emergency medicine field, uh, working in the uh, Women's and Children's Hospital of Singapore. Um, he, uh, yeah, besides uh, many more functions, he is the uh, chair of the pediatric task force um, from the ILCOR and was a co-author, for example, um, of the um, ILCOR advisory statement paper of uh, the pediatric core outcome set for cardiac arrest in children, the PCOSCA. Um, right, Casey, um, I would like to start with a question and would like to hear your, um, your uh, um, mind, your, like what, what, what do you think, what are the challenges of uh, setting up pediatric registries in Asia? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting webinar and uh, good morning from Singapore. So uh, in answer to your question, Francisca, um, I think the, the challenges in Asia, Asia is a big continent and uh, Asia has different uh, levels of uh, um, countries with different levels of healthcare. Uh, some are resource limited, some are resource rich like in Singapore. So the challenge is how do we uh, come together as a, as a continent uh, to uh, try to uh, standardize and share some data, but at the same time, uh, individually benefit from the registry uh, and of course the other challenge is the funding uh, for the poor countries how do we uh, help them uh, set up the registry that is meaningful uh, that uh, will benefit them on the ground like what Vinay shared thank you um no sorry would, yeah. you, would you you like to go okay. on first? Yes. Okay. So, so, so uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, so, um, so thanks a lot. Uh, uh, and I will just share a little bit from the Asian perspective. Uh, so, uh, as Mr. Well said, I'm chair of the PEATS Task Force in Ilkor. I'm also uh, uh, helping uh, in the uh, Singapore Research and First Aid Council. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm very privileged to be invited for this uh, meeting. Uh, so this is Singapore. Uh, so I think as uh, we go into the endemic phase, I hope that uh, you know we can travel again, and uh, you know we hope to welcome uh, you know people to Singapore. And this is where I come from, uh, the KK Women and Children's Hospital, uh, the only children's hospital in Singapore. Uh, so as I said before, uh, Asia is the most varied continent. Uh, uh, I come from South Asia. Uh, China is a huge country. So is India, and of course we also have our uh, Pacific countries of uh, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, the spectrum is from resource limited to resource good backgrounds. And uh, therefore, the healthcare system accordingly follows. Um, we have a Research Council of Asia, which is part of ILCOR. And these are the current members. Uh, as you see, they are not uh, fully representative of Asia, but uh, they form a NIDAS for which, uh, for which for us, we can uh, start uh, building a stronger registry and base. Uh, Singapore belongs to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Uh, so these are the countries in ASEAN. Uh, again, uh, from Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Philippines, uh, and Indonesia. So these are, again, uh, different countries with different healthcare systems. And of course, again, I mentioned the need to uh, engage China and India. Um, this is a paper uh, from... Uh, from uh, from us, uh, talking about the Global Resuscitation Alliance uh, using Einstein recommendations for developing uh, emergency care systems to improve cardiac arrest survival. Uh, it was published uh, recently in Resuscitation. And uh, the consensus statement was uh, essentially uh, listed the fundamental elements for improving uh, out of hospital survival in uh, developing uh, ECSs. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's important to set some frameworks as we move forward, especially, as I said before, uh, in developing countries. And the frame of survival uh, to improving all the possible cardiac arrest in developing EMS systems, uh, there are two levels. So it is, uh, of course, the core is what we all know, uh, but of course, uh, covering it uh, is uh, various things like political commitment, healthcare uh, expenditure, the legislation, the basic 
uh, preventive health uh, and various other things that uh, is uh, limited in some of these countries. PARROT is an initiative uh, set up by uh, Professor Marcus Ong uh, from Singapore. I, I think most people know him. Uh, and it consists of the following countries there. And uh, essentially, uh, it is a very uh, good network to bring together uh, countries in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, coming out of PARROS uh, was a paper again recently published uh, looking at the epidemiology and the outcome of pediatric out of hospital cardiac arrest uh, from the PARROS uh, collaboration. And again, uh, these were countries that participated and uh, there was a wide variation in the survival outcomes in different countries. Uh, and again, uh, it's just an example of how, uh, you know, the registry uh, can help us understand uh, the needs of different countries. Another one I want to share is uh, within hospitals, uh, within our hospital, uh, uh, Dr. Lee Jan Hao, uh, one of our uh, pediatric incentivists has set up the Pediatric Acute and Critical Care Medicine Asian Network called PACMAN. Uh, these were the initial countries that participated in uh, PACMAN, uh, and it was set up about uh, five, six years ago. Uh, through the years, uh, the group has uh, uh, addressed things like uh, pediatric ARDS, as well as uh, pediatric brain injury. And more recently, because of, uh, and of course, sepsis, uh, they set up a sepsis network. And more recently, of course, with the COVID, uh, they came together to do uh, a multi-center cross-sectional survey um, of various needs. So the countries have grown to 13 as of uh, this year, and this is Dr. Lee Jan Hao. So again, we welcome uh, more and more members from Asia to participate uh, in this uh, collaboration. Uh, we, we mentioned about P. Koska and Vine also talked about uh, survivor, uh, survivorship, uh, you know, uh, subsequent uh, from uh, cardiac arrest. And uh, I'm sure everybody knows about uh, the recommendations from the P. Koska that was also published in the dissertation uh, recently. And uh, essentially, uh, we talked about uh, uh, how to measure survival, uh, life impact, as well as the resource use and economic impact of survivors of uh, pediatric cardiac arrest. So again, uh, for research, uh, for prospective uh, real-world monitoring of our survivors, this is very important moving forward. So smart pediatric registries, uh, SMRAT, uh, they must be standardized. We must be focused on what data we want to collect specifically. And of course, the registries must be sustainable. Uh, they must be data sets that are measurable, achievable, and practical. Uh, the data must be relevant, uh, make sense to the ground for implementation and for learning. Uh, it must be timely. It cannot be like five, six years ago and historical. And the challenges are, uh, how do we come together uh, within Asia and beyond? How to reach out to these resource in the countries? Cultural language, language issues, not just English. Uh, how do we engage them? We mentioned a bit about data privacy. Um, and how do we uh, set up collaborations? And the funding, of course, is very important. Uh, what is the role of WHO, Save the Children, etc.? cetera? Uh, Reading showed this. Uh, essentially, what we want to do is to create a learning ecosystem uh, from the pediatric registry so that we can uh, improve uh, survivorship and care for our pediatric patients. Uh, so we need to integrate better uh, within ourselves, uh, reach out through various existing registries, uh, integrate internationally uh, uh, through ILCOR and other organizations. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me again. And um, uh, this is my email. If there's anything, please uh, feel free to email me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, I would like, uh, as you mentioned funding in the beginning, I would like to ask you if you have any tips on funding, how to sustain these uh, pediatric registries. Yeah, so, so I think, um, we, I was thinking of, okay, so within Singapore, we have funders and all that. Uh, and uh, we build, like, uh, for example, with the Duke uh, NUS Medical School, we have a global outreach. We have philanthropy funds from there. We can start from there. Uh, we can also reach out to various uh, philanthropy uh, organizations. I, I was thinking of Gates Foundation and all that, WHO, some of these things. I think uh, we can reach out. And if we reach out as a world community, 
especially for uh, focusing on developing countries, I think uh, we can make a case for it um, moving forward. Um, and uh, also we can uh, discuss with ILCOR and other organizations to see how we can uh, also fund together collectively as a global uh, organization and uh, family and the village. So there are opportunities. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. We now do have a question from the audience, uh, which mm -hmm. is from Antonio Verritex Nunes. Um, he's asking, ha having in mind the huge number of potential patients and countries to be included in Asian registries, do you consider yes. a minimum data package or would you uh, prefer full data registries? Uh, I, I think we would have to customize to the needs. Uh, I, I think uh, at the beginning, if we are engaging a developing country, uh, probably we want to start off with specific uh, needs of the, that, that community that we're engaging first. And then subsequently, once we build the foundation, I think it's a matter of scaling up. Um, and uh, the, the other difficulty is, of course, collecting the data. But uh, if you're talking about developing countries like in Cambodia, I do some outreach activities in Cambodia, and they are actually jumping the queue from uh, handwritten registries and all that to actually using cloud. So if we can actually, uh, you know, fund some of these, uh, it may actually help uh, moving forward, making the leap, uh, you know, to getting the data. Uh, what I think uh, we have to discuss the needs, and it probably needs to be customized to the what is needed on the ground as we move forward. Right. Okay. Um, I do have another question myself uh, I would like yes. to ask. Um, you mentioned or you showed just very shortly uh, the different survival rates of the different countries um, mm -hmm. of the out of hospital cardiac arrest um, right and um, do you think the cause is more um, or I don't know if it's um, answerable even but do you think the cause is more of the system or um, as you mentioned also the um, cultural willingness to help strangers like the bystander CPR yeah, it's probably, uh, the answer is always uh, somewhere in between. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, it probably needs to be uh, contextualized to the, to the actual countries. So if we find country X, the survivorship is quite low, we probably have to deep dive into the specifics uh, in a sensitive manner to try to understand uh, what are the limitations. Is it because of uh, the way the system is arranged? Uh, is there a uh, non-centralized, decentralized, there's no incentive for for, for, for the care to be delivered, uh, you know, uh, the one who pays more can get the care, the access to care uh, and affordability and all that. All these things need to be understood. Culturally, it's important also. Um, so again, we need to understand what are the fears uh, and uh, cultural beliefs in the, in the population. Um, uh, not cardiac arrest, but I remember I was doing some outreach in Laos and they had uh, uh, incidents of a quite incidents of neonatal tetanus and what they do is that when the babies are born uh, they actually use some traditional uh, stone equipment to cut the cord which contains tetanus uh, so so that is is a cultural thing they believe it's cleaner but actually we know it's not clean so it's just one example of mm -hmm. you know something that we need to uh, understand and then educate and uh, uh, you know, be sensitive to, to the cultural needs, but at the same time, try to improve the care. I mean, you know, I, I agree with you that there's probably multiple factors involved. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, according to the time, I guess I would hand over to Anna and Kevin now. Um, thanks again, Casey, for this great talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Francisca. Um, my name is Anna. I will be kindly introducing uh, Kevin in a second. Um, I'm in Berlin. I'm an Amnesty International Care Physician and the Vice Chair of the Young ERC. And Kevin has done uh, great work in Maryland. He's currently the Medical Director of uh, Charles County um, EMS Service. Um, he's started the Resuscitation Academy in 2012. And since then, more than 1,500 clinicians have been trained through the RA Academy there. Um, He's also worked um, on the task force for the AHA for the telephone CPR and is the executive director for MIMS. And what that means, he will tell us in a second. So, Kevin. You're correct. Microphone, Kevin. Uh, try that unmuted. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good evening, um, I'm Kevin Seaman. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. 
and it's a great conversation. Uh, I hope to make this uh, add a little bit to this as well, but I think it's a great discussion. Um, so if it's okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll share my screen. Oops. And can you all see that? Is my screen visible to everyone or? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I am uh, an emergency physician, but I'm also a uh, EMS physician in, in Maryland. And uh, so it uh, seemed to be the uh, V9R and are holding up the US part of this. And uh, I think I'm one of the few uh, EMS physicians here but we're going to describe the implementation of CARES, the Cardiac Arrest Registry to Enhance Survival in the state of Maryland with an idea uh, to focusing on pediatric out of hospital cardiac arrest. And so if you have not heard about CARES, this is looking from 30,000 feet out in space, looking at the United States. CARES is a national uh, data set, a national registry for cardiac arrest, both adult and pediatric. And uh, the green states are those that have implemented uh, CARES. Blue are underway. If you see, if you can see the small dot that says Washington, D.C., Maryland is above that, uh, above Washington, D.C. And this encompasses uh, approximately 20 states, uh, 1,700 EMS agencies, 1,900 hospitals. Last year, there were 127,000 non traumatic cardiac arrest cases in CARES. So, uh, so certainly um, a large data set, and of those with hospital outcomes, they were less uh, missing, those missing hospital outcomes were less than 0.15% lost to follow-up. So I think that is a robust in the outcome uh, portion of that. Uh, so if we focus in, this is Maryland, and Maryland is uh, bordered on the eastern shore by the Atlantic Ocean, separating us from Europe. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, the red there is Central Maryland. That's uh, uh, the Baltimore suburbs of Baltimore City, which is very populous, the most populous area in Maryland. The orange is the Washington D.C. suburb, Maryland to Washington D.C. suburb. So again, fairly populous. Uh, we have 6.2 million people, and it's an area of 32,000 uh, square kilometers. And I think the important thing is that Maryland takes a systems approach to EMS. And that's important here. And I would make the point that, um, uh, you know, for, for maximizing pediatric cardiac arrest survival, it takes a system to save a victim. That's a, one of the mantras of the Resuscitation Academy. And I would say here that uh, pre-hospital, uh, working with the hospitals, uh, working with among the two, I think we can combine and collaborate to improve survival for pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest victims. We only have 10 minutes to save a life, that's 600 seconds that we have to institute the interventions that save lives. And I think that uh, if EMS succeeds here, it's gonna provide more patients for our hospitals to have something to work with and to bring a survivor back. So okay. you may, okay. yes, go ahead, I'm sorry, no, no, please. No, no, it's okay. Um, we wanted to focus more on the early elements, right? So you've implemented some of the telephone CPRs. Um, could you tell us more? Yes, absolutely. And, and so um, you may have seen this graphic from uh, Deacon in um, resuscitation, uh, but this says that all the links in the chain of survival um, are not equal. And so the 911 center, the ability of an assertive um, dispatcher to implement telephone CPR that results in uh, bystander CPR before EMS arrives can have the biggest impact. It can get bystander CPR to a majority of victims of cardiac arrest, in this case, pediatric cardiac arrest. And by doing that, it can intervene in that window that makes a difference and it can lengthen that window a little bit so that when EMS does arrive, then EMS CPR and defibrillation and treatment can make a difference. So again, if we, luckily we don't have to pick one, but if we had to pick one, I think intervening in the dispatch center to get more bystander CPR for more pediatric victims of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest before EMS arrives would be a very productive strategy. 
So, um, Kevin, considering the fact that we've heard in the previous talks that the cardiac arrest numbers are quite little, considering we've, we've talked about very large numbers, CARES database have established, could you show us a bit more data on pediatric cardiac arrests for Maryland? Absolutely, and I think it does coordinate well with some of the other speakers. So here, um, so Maryland, uh, what we had to do was um, get a single electronic PCR for the entire state. We have 24 counties and we have two cities, Baltimore City and Annapolis, our capital. We had to get all of them on the same EPCR. Um, in our state, uh, some of the challenges are that uh, our EMS uh, clinicians are very good and they're very capable, uh, but they're also very, very busy and very much in a hurry. And they tend to put the data into their narrative rather than into data fields. And if, as you know, what do they say, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have any data, then it's hard to analyze the data. Mm -hmm. So what we did was also created, work with the vendor and created a situation that when it was a cardiac arrest, a tab popped up with the CARES data elements and the, it made it easier for the EMS clinicians. They were happy with that. What we didn't quite share with them was that those fields are validated, meaning that if they didn't fill out those fields, they couldn't complete their report. So it really allowed us to get more accurate data in data fields for these cardiac arrests, including pediatrics. Now you can see here that our all comers out, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest for the four years we've had complete data, it ranges from about 6,800 or 6,700 to uh, almost close to 8,000. But then in the uh, golden kind of color, you can see the number of pediatric cardiac arrests for each of those years is maybe from 140 to uh, 150. So a huge um, difference, differential in survivors in terms of pediatrics versus adults. And we are just uh, getting to the point where we have more numbers to be able to look at some trends uh, because with a single year, we're talking about maybe single digits in some of the, um, the counties, it's a little bit hard to really look for uh, either statistical or clinical significance sometimes. And I think that is a challenge that we have to uh, think about, address, and, and, um, and uh, include in our planning, basically. Um, before we move on to the next slide, I would like to ask you one more thing to, um, considering we're talking about the quality data input for cardiac registries. And do you put in dispatch CPR content as well as part of the compulsory elements for the case registry? Anna, that is a great question, and uh, I would say that uh, it is essential. Uh, there is a, a dispatch module of um, CARES that actually gets data from the, um, the CAD, the computer-aided dispatch uh, computer in the 911 center. And in Maryland right now, we don't import that into CARES, but we, we actively are working on, uh, most of our jurisdictions could do that now, but there's a few that can't. So we're working on getting it in our system, all of these counties, these 24 counties to be able to input that data. And that will help us with uh, getting those components of telephone CPR and what interventions are done before EMS arrives. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, and speaking of interventions, I know you have a breakdown about shockable, non shockable rhythms uh, spread out also. Do you mind showing us that? Because obviously that makes a difference in terms of age groups of what the reasons are for cardiac arrest. Sure, well, thank you, Anna. And I think that, um, again, with now with four years of data, we wanted to look at some trends and we looked by age. And, um, you know, this data is also, uh, this is, we're not the only place that has shown this, but in fact, I reviewed an article for resuscitation from the Netherlands that I think had very similar um, findings. And that is that, as age increases on our x-axis, age range is zero to one, uh, one year plus one day to 12, 12 years plus one day to 18, the rate of shockable cases goes up and uh, survival for shockable pediatric cardiac arrest goes up significantly. And uh, we, on the right, we look at non-shockable and that's a little bit of a different curve. For non-shockable, our survival for the infants is uh, very low, 0.04%. Uh, for the 1 to 12, it's 13%. Uh, and then uh, for the uh, you know, 13 to 18, uh, it's, it drops off there. So I think we see some trends here. I think um, it has some implications. For example, the, the treatments for shockable pediatric cardiac arrests are good quality CPR and defibrillation. 
and those are best done on the scene. And what we anecdotally know from our EMS clinicians in Maryland is that pediatric cardiac arrest is a low frequency, high acuity event that causes a lot of anxiety for our EMS providers. And in fact, their tendency is to load and go. Let's get to the hospital really quickly. But it turns out that that time to get to the hospital is that window is long enough that it means that no other interventions really make a difference. So really the best quality care for those patients is on scene with good quality CPR and defibrillation, getting a return of spontaneous circulation. And it turns out that a rising tide floats all boats that the non-shockable pediatric cardiac arrest primarily in the younger age range would also benefit from high quality CPR and defibrillation when indicated. But so diving into our data a little bit, understanding a little bit, uh, wanting to inform our education and our implementation, I think is really the, the perspective that we take on our data, which is really using it to, to improve survival is our goal. Yeah, so um, speaking of implementation and, um, and the definite knowledge gap we know exists in pediatric cardiac arrest, um, and also the tailoring of which is graphically shown in the national group rhythms, especially in the group above 12 years of age. Um, what do you think? Um, is there a way of implementing certain timeframes? Because obviously, you've done, if you've undertaken changes, is there an optimum intervention time where to re-monitor the quality of care you've potentially affected in a positive way? Well, again, um, very cogent question, Anna. Thank you. I think that... Uh, uh, you may be familiar with the article out of um, Polk County, Florida by Dr. Paul Pepe, uh, but they implemented a bundle of care and they had, again, had a very low number of pediatric cardiac arrests, I believe it was in the you know, mid 100s, but they postulated that implementing a bundle of care that included high performance CPR, that included defibrillation as soon as possible, that included IV or IOO access, that included IV or IO epinephrine as soon as possible. Uh, the group of those interventions showed improved survival or was associated with improved survival. So again, I think that should, you know, in terms of research, it would be good to, to see if that holds out in a larger data set. But, uh, you know, we're actively looking at this and think that perhaps educating and intervening for our EMS providers to say that they are really in that 10 minutes are the best chance that this small um, child or infant has, and they should give it their best effort, uh, implement these things that seem to make a difference. Again, more data would be helpful and uh, celebrate each survivor that we have in a positive way to show that, uh, that these EMS clinicians that are working very hard in very difficult circumstances are making a difference. Uh, but I think that's the direction we're looking in going um, using data to make decisions, but then trying to improve survival. Okay, perfect, thank you. So um, we'll definitely need to summarize now your take home points. Okay, great. Well, so um, I'm gonna build off of what Vine had introduced earlier. And so to say that um, we know the medical science fairly well, I, I think we could add a little bit always to it, but really it's how we educate and how we implement. And so what I would say is, uh, you know, that's one of the lessons here. And uh, so to measure, to improve, really to have a registry, if we don't know where we start, we don't know where we want to go, we can't figure out where we want to go if we don't know where we're starting. So I think we have to absolutely have to measure. Um, I believe that uh, it can help us understand uh, uh, our clinical performance and then really kind of implement or draft what we want to implement to change that. Certainly pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest resuscitation depends on uh, really high, high, high level um, pre-hospital practice, clinical practice. And we need to continue to educate and tell these providers they make a difference and they have to give it their best in this very short window to try to get the most survivors we can out of this. Uh, we certainly can with uh, education then work on implementation. And as we said, I think part of this might be working the code on scene, giving it the best effort and uh, transporting those patients, uh, either that you get return of spontaneous circulation on, or if you don't, then transporting them after a good effort on scene. Uh, certainly then education implementation are the critical to improving pediatric cardiac arrest survival. And in terms of the earlier question, there's huge variation across communities and across uh, 
uh, databases. And I think that education and implementation are really uh, a great equalizer to help us uh, float all boats, really raise the pediatric survivors across all, um, all communities that have variation in their survival. With that, I'll stop and uh, answer any questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think in terms of time, we should um, hand over to the next speaker and um, ask Casper to introduce. And I think towards the end, any questions, especially one with the neonatal station element, we'll discuss in the panel discussion. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, yeah, I'll also just quickly advertise for our uh, Q and A uh, function uh, that you can use because right after Vina's presentation, we will have um, time to to some more questions to all of our speakers here. Um, but I will give the word over to Vina again. And Vina, he has also been a founding member of both the Get with the Guidelines Registry and the PD Rescue uh, Registry. And so uh, Vina, take it away. Well, thank you, Casper. And um, Kevin, I think um, one of the things that you point out is that we have these out of hospital registries. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the in hospital registries we have in the US and they don't really communicate very well. It's kind of like we got the kids to the door, but we're not sort of reporting on their post-cardiac arrest care and their interventions, et cetera. So we can learn a lot from each other. The data elements may need to be different, but um, there's probably a lot of opportunity for us to link so that we can understand what happened pre-hospital, in the ED, in the ICU, in the cath lab and beyond. Um, I'd like to talk for just a couple minutes about PD Rescue, which is a, uh, a quality improvement registry collaborative and also get with the guidelines resuscitation, which was the American Heart Association's first national registry of CPR for adults and children. And I have no financial conflicts, but I do have some research grants and some sit on some scientific advisory boards, including the American Heart Association Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation and the Zoll Medical Sponsored PD Rescue um, Data Col Collaborative. Um, if we think about kind of the alphabet soup of what we've heard about, there are a lot of definitions, there are a lot of registries around but Get With the Guidelines was one of the first to try to get an in-hospital uh, standard data set with standardized definitions queued to ILCOR's Utstein definitions, and now exists in more than 400 hospitals across the United States, and has established itself not only as a registry where research data can be called, but also predominantly for quality improvement and also to inform and advocate for administrators. And it's been incorporated into the Joint Commission's um, uh, accreditation of hospitals. And it started out by sort of just describing things. In the first 10 to 50,000 cases, uh, the incidence of in and out of hospital cardiac arrest, the difference in where children were arresting 93% in the ICU, whereas adults mostly on the wards, only 53% in the intensive care units, and the difference in survival outcomes, the etiology of arrests, and even the frequency with which in-hospital cardiac arrest occurs. The Get With The Guidelines registry has now more than 500,000 in-hospital adult cardiac arrests and more than 30,000 pediatric in-hospital cardiac arrests. Um, so they represent maybe 3% of the reported cardiac arrests. Um, but one of the uh, important aspects is if you sign up to join, if your hospital signs up, you must input all of your cardiac arrests in the hospital so that incomplete data doesn't sort of cloud the results. We early on in the registry um, recognized that CPR was easy to recognize and report but the important things that happened around it before arrest, during the arrest, following the arrest, and even out to survivorship were really, really important that we needed to track. And so as the registry matured, we started to add on additional modules that were specific to neonatology, specific to cardiac ICUs, specific to um, the pediatric uh, environment. And then on the bottom left, 
specifically that allowed entry of patients who had arrested out of hospital and were managed in the hospital to enter our registry. And so we came up with modules for medical emergency teams for cardiac arrest, for acute respiratory compromise and intubation, and for post-cardiac arrest care that could be either added on to the basic database or done in, independently. And this allowed a, a quality improvement perspective to be generated with report cards and, um, and metrics for success. Indeed, with the accreditation program in 2017, we added levels of performance of hospitals, gold, silver, bronze, so that there were kind of a competitive, it's the US after all, a competitive metric that hospitals could compete for and display with pride. And then we started with this registry to be able to take on an interesting challenge. We wanted to marry the training of providers in hospital with their performance and the outcomes. And so as the resuscitation quality improvement rolling refresher cart became popular and now is more than 2000 US hospitals, we're able to gather training data as well as performance data and outcome data in the same registry, which starts to marry and improve our ability to figure out where the issues lie. Now, this slide that was created by KC um, sort of is a learning system for the real hospital environments with a feedback loop on real world data. But what I'd like to propose is that perhaps we should mirror image that and collect data on our mock codes and our training that we can marry. And indeed, the Get With The Guidelines registry now has a tick box where when you enter a cardiac arrest in hospital, you can check off whether it was a mock code or whether it was a real code. So we can allow hospitals to start marry. Are they doing all of their training between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., but all of their arrests are occurring between 5 p.m. and 8 in the morning? Perhaps they need to switch that focus. But it's not just the individual training. It's the team training and the system training that needs to be assessed in a registry individuals, teams, and systems. And so we created a voluntary PD rescue registry that is really a quality improvement and research collaborative, which was intended to capture and optimize resuscitation practice. It has almost 50 contributing pediatric hospitals across the world and a website where you can look at the data in much more detail. This collaborative recognizes that the patient factors, the event and system factors, plus the complex interventions like targeted temperature management is not just temperature, it's all the surrounding things we need to capture that result in the outcomes that we care about, including quality of life. So we dissect apart the pre-arrest, the inter-arrest and the post-resuscitative care, the review and debriefings and the long-term follow-up to track to be able to report. How does the individual, the team and the system train and how do they function? We can generate benchmarking dashboards that instantly update as a new entry enters the registry. We can generate report cards that can be used in after event debriefing. And we can track not just the CPR event, but the post cardiac care compliance compared to guidelines and our center compared to other centers. With this, we can then distill in a retrospective fashion and infer whether the depth of chest compressions, how is the landscape of performance across the hospitals that are participating? We can question and report how often do hot debriefings occur after events and what is the content of what people talk about and discuss and debrief on? We can develop checklists and test their efficacy in predicting or detecting cardiac arrest risk. And then we can take intensive data from the monitors and defibrillators and bedside monitors and start to integrate it so that we can discover if the current recommendations for depth, chest compression fraction, release velocity, end tidal CO2, amplitude spectral array on termination of fibrillation, pauses in chest compression, 
what effect are they having and what associations do they have with the outcomes? These are the values. And then we can start to overlay on the registry infrastructure interventional trials like a CPR coach trial that's currently ongoing where we can do a stepped wedge design to examine prospectively effect of interjecting a CPR coach on practice. As we talked about, subsets of the sites can collaborate to do even more intense data gathering like the Viper initiative in our emergency departments that collect video data, video laryngoscopy, and the bedside ultrasound data during events and collate it and analyze it in intense fashion. And on the other side, for resource limited settings, what can we do to collect a few data points that start to move some very simple interventions like monitoring and fluid bolus and opening the airway? How can we track that? I come back to one of our original slides, which suggested that if we knew something, who, what, when, where, why, a cardiac arrest occurred in the world for children. And if we had a subset of those in registries where 10 data points were collected on a key important manner, within that a quality improvement consortium, research collaboratives, and overlaid specific research studies, I think we could move forward much faster. Our formula for survival and survivorship is improving because of registries. But what I would like to warn us, it is not the collection of data and reporting and sending in of registry data that makes any difference at all. It is the use of that data to improve the medical science, the educational efficiency and the local implementation that indeed will make the difference. All of us that have spoken today have identified finances and funding, collaboration and silos, leadership and role delineation, lack of sustainability, institutional and organizational buy-in, the lack of data integration from out of hospital to in hospital and even within our monitors within the hospital, and the practical implementation and management, the exhaustion of collecting data and as Antonio Rodriguez would point out to us, our mission and vision scope creep, our desire to be perfect, our desire to know it all sometimes kills our desire and our ability to know something. So Casey mentioned the SMART goals. We do have to be smart. And he also showed us that the real world and our training and world can be linked by registries to improve outcomes. Over and back to you, Casper. Thank you very much, Vinay. Uh, always inspiring talk uh, from you. So I really think due to the time uh, of the session, I actually think that I will uh, give the word straight over to Tino, um, who will uh, start a bit about the overall uh, Q&A for all of you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kasper. Uh, now we start a, a Q&A session, a round table discussing in between the speakers. I, we have a, a very interesting question on, from the audience, which I would like to throw in for the speakers. Uh, do we have data on the use of EDs by bystanders on baby small children, I have no clue. So is this something which we can extract from such databases? And as Vina said, what, what is the answer? So what do we get out if we know, I don't know, such, such and such percentage and AD was used by a lay person. So what do we learn out of this? Question for, for the, uh, the uh, Registry geeks. You know, it's Kevin. I'll just yeah. I can speak for CARES, and we certainly do capture bystander um, AED use. So I think that that's capable to be able to look at that and look at the interaction with that with age for cardiac arrest. Um, I think the other part of that question is a little harder because I don't think that's captured in the CARES database, which is uh, 
are they using pediatric pads or uh, pediatric specific uh, AED equipment? But I think whether an a, a, a bystander AED was applied and whether it was actually uh, used, I think is captured. So maybe I, I, another question which, I, which comes to my mind, we, we, I saw now a lot of data collecting, uh, quantitative data coming in. Is there an idea in all this register to look also qualitative? So asking people who are entering data, what does it mean to, to get this, this often called soft issue, soft skills? I don't know, Vina, maybe you. I can, I can contribute a little bit. Um, so the Quality Improvement Collaborative in PD Rescue spends a lot of time. We have monthly teleconferences uh, and webinars where we discuss different aspects and present on, um, for instance, on hot debriefing, cold debriefing, what is brought up, how do you accomplish it, how do you pre-identify your patients, et cetera. This is in the in-hospital setting. But I think Paul Chan, uh, with the heroic study, he actually went and did qualitative uh, focus groups within hospitals, within the get with the guidelines, adult registry, this is adult data. And he looked at the top tertile and the bottom tertile performing teams, the outcomes in that registry, top notch or bottom notch. And then he qualitatively identified different characteristics of the resuscitation teams and the resuscitation program within the hospital that differentiated between the high performers and the lower performers. And what came out very clear to me, Tino, you may even know this be data better than I do, but my impression was that the champion, having a champion in the hospital, having a regular debriefing meeting and having a system that was linked together for recognition, training and performance seemed to be the three things that made a difference for in-hospital resuscitation in the hospitals that participate and get with the guidelines resuscitation. Do you take the same messages away, Tino? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a very important area we should look much more because then we get different answers and specifically also comparing it's it's not a competition, it's really to figure out why are some people, some institutions, some systems to say very general performing on a higher level and others not on such a higher level because all the intention of all of them are doing a good job. Anna, do you so, want to add something? Um, I actually have a question which came up earlier when Kevin was presenting and I think it's a, and I saw Vina also answering on it and it's regarding the neonatal life support. So there's obviously a big focus on uh, BLS training and which makes difference probably more for adults. But um, for, there was a question from the audience regarding neonatal life support or pediatric life support. A, when should we start? Should we target um, freshly, uh, fre well, not freshly made parents, but freshly made babies? <laughs> New parents. <laughs> Sentence. Um, and how often should you repeat these training sessions? Um, so I was thinking there's um, multiple specialists in this audience to, to answer this, but... Um, Considering it came up during Kevin's talk, I'll start with Kevin first and then. Okay, Anna, well, I like your description. I think they are newly newly um, created parents as well. So uh, I think there's no time better than to uh, engage parents to say, we're gonna teach you a life-saving skill that uh, can help you if this uh, emergency happens. And I think our fond goal is that it never happens, but I do think, uh, getting parents uh, trained. I mean, the, the issue, um, CPR should be a civic responsibility. CPR for infants should be a civic responsibility, but I think the parents are the best uh, uh, advocates, cheerleaders for those infants and would, would uh, obviously right there with them and could give uh, immediate CPR. And if the training is good and the quality is good, I think that uh, could help save lives. Has anyone collected data on this uh, regarding parental teaching on natal life support? Vina is shaking his head very strongly. <laughs> I think Vina is saying yes with that. Yes, I think there is some information. There's more information on parental training and parental performance. So Kathy Drakeup 
many years ago studied training parents uh, prior to the delivery of their baby and uh, the positive effect it had uh, on either simulated sudden infant death syndrome resuscitation or in the few cases that they had that ha where the babies actually stopped breathing at home. Um, there's more and more data that Tino is much more expert than I am uh, in terms of spaced learning and more information evolving in terms of the, the benefit. But one thing I just wanna bring up is the teachable moment. I think what we're finding more and more is that gating the training just in time to when you feel you have a risk for providing that service seems to make a big difference in the retention and the uh, engagement of the learner. Uh, and I don't know, maybe Tino or others have other observations on that. So uh, I can tell you, there's quite a lot of data on training in after cardiac arrest in adults. So, so family members are trained on CPI and they are willing to do, to participate in, in such a training. And even the, the victims of a cardiac arrest in these rehab centers. And if we can use the same strategy in neonatology, in pediatrics, this would give a huge impact. I always figure out if pe people are waiting in the waiting room for the doctor's consultant. There are quite a lot of videos on the screens, but having a short BLS uh, pediatric uh, video showing them how to do it, this, this is the, the teaching moment we can use it. And par parents get some instruction on, on their babies, uh, what to do, and, and, and this is, is a job for the resuscitation council, for the local resuscitation councils to, in the implementation to get in contact in the hospitals to include, for example, a short, simple training showing what to do if your kid is in a strange situation. And you know, when you say, yeah, and what when you, what when you say, we know now for, from a lot of educational intervention that small interventions, short 15 minutes, 20 minutes, over time, every three or six months, have a much higher impact than the big chunk of a one day course or whatever. Tino, great points. And this is Kevin. I just wanted to share yeah. very quickly that that supports your point that uh, we have over the past two years been um, implementing a low dose, high frequency CPR training for both adults, but also for infants uh, from RQI partners that would be that low dose, high frequency education, 15 minutes every three months. And these mannequins are good enough to, to measure uh, sort of what Vinay uh, displayed for the hospital. They're, uh, they're uh, high fidelity enough to measure and then to report to the cloud their metrics. And we find the metrics are very good. The, you know, CPR fraction is over 80%, their rate is correct, their depth is correct. And so I think that um, that brings up the point that CPR for pediatrics and for adults, it's a, a low frequency, high acuity kind of case. We don't see it very often. And, and the, our old training models of here's you get trained and your, your CPR card is like your um, warranty, like your tires, you're warranted for two years. It doesn't really work. We really need low dose, high frequency education. I think that makes a huge difference. So I'll stop there, but just uh, new educational strategies can make a big difference as well. I agree with you. Jimena, you wanted to contribute. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to say that I agree with all of you that, and that it might be easy. I mean, it's it's something we've been doing with the specific patients, like patients with uh, that have a tracheostomy, for instance, or are dependent on, on mechanical ventilation, or patients that have uh, had uh, a car cardiac, uh, okay, cardiac surgery. Or we, we do train those patients, but it, um, it's a matter of... Uh, time to and dedication in most countries and uh, I think uh, world within worldwide most most people who who assess this kind of issues are uh, have too many things to do and uh, well I can think and when, when we looked in, into Latin America for instance uh, most patients uh, are arrested in the ER because they 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 didn't have the the chance to get to the hospital before they were seriously ill 
So uh, I think that what you said, you know, about using the new virtual resources and trying to to get all that information in their own language everywhere will help us reach the uh, this kind of of, of parents and 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 families which we are not being able to now. Kasper, you wanted to contribute. Yeah, so I just uh, saw that we had uh, a question for the Q&A that Vinay uh, showed interest in answering. And that the question is building on the previous questions on ADs. How can we use registry data to improve ADs and the AD programs? Uh, Vinay. Yeah, I really, um, I think it's not just AEDs, but um, there is work coming out from CARES, uh, the National CARES Registry that is looking at the pediatric application of AEDs. It, um, CARES doesn't, as, as Kevin said, it doesn't um, e actually even require collection of whether the AED fired or, uh, or collect the information from the AED and it doesn't necessarily tell us, but the, um, the preliminary data, which is not to be um, taken is about 8% of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the U.S. in the in the CARES registry regions have an AED applied under the age of 18, higher in the adolescents than it is in the one to eight-year-olds than it is in the infants, and the outcome of those patients is indeed better, significantly better. But it, we don't know whether that's because the the bystanders that are using the AEDs are perhaps trained better. You know, there there are these other factors that could be doing it, but how could we use it? Even collecting whether it was placed and whether it shocked. And if you think about between Europe and the US, we recommend two joules per kilo for initial shock dose, Europe four joules per kilo for initial shock dose. We could have a natural experiment that could be captured by a registry and improve our AED programs if we had registries that worked. This is a Good point to switch to uh, Anna because time is running out and I would like to ask Anna to make the close up and the closure from this webinar. Okay, thank you. Um, so today we've spoken about multiple um, strategies of how to implement cardiac arrest registries um, to identify the gaps. We've um, identified implementation teaching um, methods. We've talked about the limited data we have, but there's potential obviously to improve. And we've seen from different sides of the world of what has been done to, to go step by step closer towards the improving survival in neonates and children. And um, we've had interesting take home points as well and questions from the audience, which has obviously led to um, a discussion. And there's it, every time you don't know what you don't know. And every time you ask a question, there's more questions coming from that. So um, I've taken away a lot and I'm very glad that we've had this international panel today. So thank you very much for everyone's time. Um, I'm sure everyone has had their email address, which is also recorded. Um, so you can look it up and contact um, the faculty later at some point if you have any other burning questions. Thank you. Yeah. And that says thank you, goodbye, have a nice evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank thank you so much. Bye. Great Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.